Thank you for being in the room, and also for those of you joining us online today, we welcome you to the service here today. Before I get started, just a couple things. Don't forget about Mother's Day. Bosco mentioned that. Mother's Day, two weeks from today, you need to use that opportunity to invite somebody. If you have children, bring them with you. If you have adult children, put a guilt trip on them. You're good at doing that, moms, all right? Uh, just tell them, you know, uh, you got to come to church with me. Just make sure you get them here, all right? And um, that is a part of what we do here. Our mission is bringing people, wherever they are, into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And we don't fulfill that mission without bringing people. So invite somebody. I hope that you will invite somebody. Now, in honor of Mother's Day... This Saturday, May the 4th, we're going to have a ladies' tea, and that's going to be a wonderful thing. I know that all the people that work every week for our Wednesday prayer uh, service and the lunch and the food, it's just amazing. It's so good, and I know this ladies' tea is going to be awesome as well. So make sure that you're here for that. It's for women and girls. And if you'd like to be a part of that, that is this Saturday at 11 o'clock, all right? And it's going to be really good, and I hope you'll be uh, able to come to that. Now, speaking of, our next step class, we do that after the service once a month. We'll do it after both services today. So uh, I'll meet with you back in the back if you have questions about church membership or if you have questions about uh, anything concerning the church, then you come back and see me and uh, we'll have a great time. Well, today I want to continue the series in the book of Mark and I want to speak to you on this thought. The greatest ability is availability. Now think about this. The greatest ability is being available. All right. Availability. Now that doesn't mean that we shouldn't uh, work and hone our talents and get better at what we do. But the most important thing about serving the Lord is being available to serve Him. Often we get so busy, our focus is elsewhere, and we forget that the greatest ability is availability. And I want to read to you from one of the most famous stories in the Gospels. It's about when Jesus fed 5,000 men and their families with five loaves and two fish. Now, when we think of five loaves, we're talking about breadsticks. All right, think of going to Olive Garden to get breadsticks. Five of those and two fish, okay? And then we're not talking about big tarpon, okay? We're talking about regular small fish that they would eat for lunch in those days. So one boy's lunch, enough to feed one boy, and Jesus took it. And he fed 5,000 people and their families. This is incredible. So we're going to read uh, in Mark chapter 6 and begin reading with me in verse number 30. The apostles returned to Jesus from their ministry tour and told him all they had done and taught. And Jesus said, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. Sometimes you just need a break. Sometimes you need a little rest. And they had been working really, really hard, and so they wanted to go to a quiet place and rest. And Jesus said, because there were so many people coming and going, that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. They were busy. So they left by boat for a quiet place where they could be alone. But many people recognized them and saw them leaving, and people from many towns ran ahead along the shore and got there ahead of them. And Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat, and he had compassion on them. Aren't you glad Jesus has compassion? Aren't you glad that he gives us his mercy? They're renewed every day. Jesus had compassion on these people, and so uh, he saw that they were like, Sheep without a shepherd. And so he began teaching them many things. Late in the afternoon, you might want to be thankful that you've got me in preaching because I don't preach till all into the afternoon, all right? Mine's normally about 30, 35 minutes, right? So, but Jesus was speaking all day, basically. And um, 
he said, uh, late in the afternoon, his disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it is already getting late. Send the crowds away so that they may go to nearby farms and villages and buy something to eat. But Jesus told them, you feed them. You feed them. With what? They asked. I love this. With what? We'd have to work for months to earn enough money to buy food for all these people. How much bread do you have? He asked. Go and find out. So here Jesus gave them a mission, and they immediately came up with excuses. We're pretty good at that, right? God tells us to do something, and we're like, what? We can't do that. Uh, You want me to do what, Lord? With what? Just like the disciples were doing. But they came back and reported, we have five loaves of bread and two fish. And then Jesus told the disciples to have the people sit down in groups on the grass. And so they sat down in groups of 50 or 100. And Jesus took the five loaves and two fish. And he looked up to heaven and blessed them. And then breaking the loaves into pieces, he kept giving the bread to the disciples so they could distribute it to the people. He also divided the fish for everyone to share. And they all had as much as they wanted. And afterward, the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftover bread and fish. A total of 5,000 men and their families were fed. Wow, what an incredible, incredible story. Well, there's a a few things that I want to point out to you, really just a little pattern that I want to talk to you about today, and it comes right from the last part of what we read. He took it, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it. And I want to make that application to us. Whenever we give ourselves to Jesus, whenever we make an effort to say yes to him, he will take us, and he will bless us. And he will break us, and then he will use us. So I want to just kind of point out what he does in that. First of all, he takes us. Aren't you glad that Jesus takes us just as we are? Aren't you glad that we don't have to earn our way to heaven? Aren't you glad that God looks at us, and when we say yes to him, he always, without fail, will receive us. He takes us just as we are. Don't you like that? I remember... In the old Billy Graham crusades, I used to watch some of those on television. You ever see those? At the end of Billy Graham's messages, they would always give an invitation. They'd ask people to come forward, and they'd always sing this song, Just As I Am. And people would come by the hundreds and get saved. Aren't you glad that Jesus takes us just as we are? You don't have to turn over a new leaf. You know, there are people that think that in order to come to Jesus, you got to get better before you do that. You got to make sure that you quit doing what you have done in the past. You got to quit sinning. That's not the way you get better. That's not the way you get forgiven and made right with God. In the same way, if you were sick, you would not, and your wife, you know, men a lot of times don't like to go to the doctor, and your wife was getting on to you, go to the doctor, go get some help. You know what you would not say? You would not say, well, as soon as I get better, I'm going to go to the doctor. That wouldn't make any sense, would it? And in the same way, we come to Jesus in spite of our sin, in spite of our brokenness, in spite of our past, and in spite of our need. In fact, we come because of those things, not in spite of those things. Aren't you glad that Jesus is in the business of saving people? that he receives us. He takes us. My family is just such a beautiful picture of that. My dad didn't go to church. His mom and dad didn't go to church. My great-grandparents, his grandparents didn't go to church. And we could just go back further and further and further in our family tree, and most of them didn't go to church. Well, my mom came from a family that was a Christian family, but they got married And guess what they did not do as a family when they got married? They did not go to church. And I was born, and when I was little, we did not go to church. But thank God my dad finally started going, and he got saved. And God 
changed his life. He took a man that didn't go to church, that was an alcoholic, who was far from God, but God took him just as he was. And he'll do the same for you. He takes us as we are. And he takes us in our need. Aren't you glad that Jesus doesn't say, well, as soon as you get better, you can come hang out with me? No. He takes us in our need. Jesus and his disciples were weary from ministering and they needed rest, but Jesus had compassion for the people that needed him. And I really do believe that we can learn from this. God is never too tired to hear you. The Bible says that he does not get weary. His ear is not deaf that it cannot hear. He's not too busy. I've heard people say, well, God's too busy running the universe to listen to me pray. And that's simply not true. He loves to hear from you. He loves when you come to him. He takes us in our need. These people had a greater need than they knew. I want you to think about that. That's the beautiful thing about Jesus. He takes us in our need, but we all have a greater need than we really can even understand or acknowledge. And when we come to him, he takes us as we are. He takes us in our need, and he takes us for his purpose. In John chapter 6, we read this same story. Um, It's about the feeding of the 5,000, but you'll find in that story that there were some things that are not included in Mark. They saw what Jesus did, and there was a group of people that wanted to take him and make him the king of Israel. And they didn't understand God's purpose because you say, well, what would be wrong with that? Well, Jesus will be king one day, but not just of Israel. He'll be king of the world. He'll be king of the universe. And so Jesus had this bigger purpose. They wanted him to be the king of their country, of their small little area But he said, I've got a bigger purpose than that. I have come not just for you. I've come for the world. I've come to bring people into right relationship with the Heavenly Father. And I really do understand that God always has a greater purpose in mind than we have for ourselves. Now, I want you to think about this. There are many of us that will think that our purpose is small. That our purpose is just doing our job buying a house, going on vacation occasionally, having some family, that I, that's what our purpose uh, consists of. And look, there's certainly nothing wrong with those things, but you have a much greater purpose than that. I, I heard this said, and I've used it a lot, I heard this said years ago, God did not let you be born just to fill some skin for a few years. He has a greater purpose in mind for your life. He wants you to live for him. And you know, your purpose is greater than you can acknowledge or imagine. God will use you in a way greater than you can acknowledge or even conceive. My family, once again, um, just demonstrate this. I grew up in a family of tobacco farmers, a family of alcoholics and drug addicts, and rednecks, and fornicators, and adulterers, and emotionally injured people, all right? If there was a problem, we probably had it, okay? That was kind of the family that I grew up in. But Jesus saw what I was, and where I was from, and he took me, and he changed me, and he began to use me for a purpose greater than I could possibly ever even imagine. And he'll do the same thing for you. And once again, that's not about the job that you have. That's not about the classiness of your family. That's about God's purpose for your life. He will use you for his purpose. He takes us. But then I want you to notice in the story what Jesus did. He took the boy's lunch. And then what was the first thing that he did? He looked up to heaven and he blessed it. Aren't you glad that God blesses us? He always blesses what is given to him. And I want you to understand this. You may not even feel like that there's a lot of blessing in your life right now. But when you give yourself to Jesus, he always blesses what is given to him. He blessed this little boy's lunch. I believe he will bless your time, your talent, 
your family, your money, your job, and your life. Look, I've seen this happen so many times over the years. Someone, maybe they had, by their own words, had wasted their life up to a certain point. Maybe as a younger person, they didn't live for God. Maybe as they got into their adult years, they, they just kind of lived for their own purpose, their own life, selfishly, and they did things that, quite frankly, they were embarrassed about. And as they got older, they turned their life to Christ, and then they feel like, well, I just wasted my youth. Do you know what God has the ability to do? He has the ability to make up for the shortcoming. He has the ability to make up for that lost time. He will multiply what is given to him. That's what Jesus does. He blesses you. He takes the small and insignificant and blesses it. Think about what he did with this story. He took a little boy's lunch. We don't even know the boy's name. We don't know how old he was, but you know, when you look at the original language in the New Testament was Greek. Uh, it gives the idea that he was just a small kid, a little lad. I mean, he wasn't like a teenager, most likely. He was just a little lad. But he gave what he had to Jesus. Now, I'm glad that Jesus looked at his disciples and asked them to do something that they could not do without God's help. You know why? Because God asks the same thing from us. He wants us to live for him. He wants us to give our talent, our time, our ability to God. And when we do that, we are acknowledging that we cannot do this life. We cannot live this Christian life apart from him. You see, here's the thing. You get in trouble when you think you can do it all on your own. You can't. It's impossible. What God wants us to understand is what is given to him he blesses. He takes it, and he blesses it. Now, I want you to think about this. Uh, we, we know that this uh, lunch was from a little boy. We, we read that in the other gospel accounts about this story, not in Mark 5 or Mark 6. Um, but God always uses what was given, what is given to him. Now, I want you to see what, uh, just a couple of applications here. Age is never an excuse. This boy wasn't a grown-up. He wasn't a leader in the community. Our age, too young, too old, too much with kids, uh, too busy, it doesn't matter. There is not an excuse because when we give to God what is ours and we give it to Him, God will use it. I love this, this little boy. So young, he, we don't even know how old he was, but God used him. And then on the other end of that, remember Moses? Moses was 80 years old when he started serving God, when he started leading. He had been dealing with sheep and living out in the desert, and God appeared to him in a burning bush. And at 80 years old, and by the way, he lived to 120 years old. I mean, you think our president is old, all right? So, uh, look, God used him all the way up beyond what would be normal to be used. Or, you know, most people would be retired far, far sooner than that. Age is not an excuse. Ability is not an excuse. Position is not an excuse. Reputation is not an excuse. When we come to God, He wants us to give to Him what is in our hand. That's all God asks. He doesn't ask you to give something you don't have. He doesn't ask you, if you can't sing, He doesn't ask you to get up in front of the church and lead worship. You know why? Because that would hurt people's ears, all right? God wants you to do what you can do. He wants you to do what He's put in your hand. And God will always use those that give what they have to him. Now, once again, the greatest ability is his availability. God uses what was given to him, but also what is seemingly to others insignificant. Now, think about it. Among a crowd of thousands of people, one little boy's lunch was insignificant. I mean, the disciples said, we found some lunch, but what is this among so many? That's insignificant. 
And the fact is, anything that is insignificant and humanized when given to God, God always uses. God always uses. I grew up in North Carolina, most of you know that. After my family got saved and we started going to church, we had lived in South Carolina for a while, and my family moved back to North Carolina, where I was born and spent most of my uh, young life. And the church that we went to, uh, there was a man, his name was Ronnie. Now, Ronnie was mentally challenged. In other words, he was not even able to really hold down a, a normal job. He was, he was mentally challenged. Um, he didn't have a lot of a talent. He didn't have a lot of ability. But you know what? He was one of the most faithful people I've ever known. He came to that church every Sunday. And let me tell you what he did. What might seem insignificant to you is very significant to God. Even though this young man, I, I can see him today. He'd always smile and laugh, and he loved children. And he had a habit, and the kids loved him. He had a habit. Every Sunday during the time that you would have, like we have our minute mingle, they'd have a handshake time, and Ronnie would go up in front of the church, and he always had a bunch of candy with him. And all the kids from the church would come forward, and Ronnie would hand out candy. He loved it. Man, he would smile. The kids loved it. And there was one little boy. His name was David. I know David. I used to go to church with him. David, I don't know if he got saved because of Ronnie, but I know that he loved coming forward every time. David was a little boy. He'd get some candy. He loved going to church. David ended up getting saved. David today is the pastor of that very church. Now, I don't know if David got saved just because of Ronnie, but I do know this, God used him. God used a man that wasn't very smart. He wasn't going to be scoring high on any IQ test. He wasn't going to be a member of Mensa. He wasn't going to be a CEO of a company someday. He wasn't even going to own his own business. He was just a very simple man. But you know what he did? He gave what was in his hand to God. And God used him. Now, here's why I believe Ronnie has passed away. But one day when he stands before God and we stand at judgment, there's going to be a lot of kids that came to church and got saved because Ronnie, you know what he loved to do? He loved to give out candy to little kids. And I love that story. And the point is this. He takes us and he blesses us. And then he breaks us. Notice what Jesus did. He took the bread and he blessed it. And then before he could use it, you know what he did? He broke it. And he kept breaking 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 it, and he kept breaking it. Why? Because he wanted to use it. And until you and I realize that God only uses broken vessels, God only uses imperfect people. That's why we have the saying, Stillwater's Church is the perfect place for imperfect people. You see, if you think you're perfect, if you think you don't need forgiveness, if you think that everything that you do is great, you're probably not going to be used by God because God uses broken people. Let me read to you from Job chapter 36, verse 15. This is Job talking about God. You remember the story of Job, how that he was wealthy and everything was good. I mean, it was good to be Job. It says he was the wealthiest man in that whole part of the world. Good to be Job. He had all kinds of assets. He had 10 kids. The man was blessed. And then in one day, everything was taken from him. His kids, his family, his business, his assets, his money. He lost it all in one day. And I want you to hear what Job said. Listen to what he said. But by means of their suffering, he rescues those who suffer. For he gets their attention through adversity. You know what Job was saying there? 
He's saying that, yeah, I suffered. And yeah, I was broken. But it got my attention on God. And it made me a better person. And we read in that story in the book of Job that in the end of Job's life, God blessed him with twice as much as he ever had before. Now, what is the point? I, I'm not suggesting that you're going to be twice as rich or uh, any of that if you go through suffering or go through troubles. But here's what I do know. God will always break you. He will always test you. And until we're willing to put ourselves into the hand of God, He will never really truly be able to use us to, to, our, uh, to our fullest capacity. So he, he takes us and He blesses us and He breaks us. And then what He is able to do at that point, He's able to use us. He's able to give us away. And, and what Jesus did with uh, those people, with that lunch, with that bread, with that fish, is he multiplied it. He always multiplies what is given to him. Jesus uses what is given to him to bless others as well. The little boy gave lunch. That's all he had to eat. Think about this. What could that boy have done with his lunch? He could have kept it. That would not I mean, I don't even know if that would even be selfish. I mean, that was his lunch. His mama gave it to him. He, he went out, and that's all he had to eat. He could have kept it. He could have sold it. I mean, you know, if I'd been that boy, and, uh, you know, they came to me, hey, we need to feed this big uh, crowd of thousands of people, I'd be like, well, how much are you going to give me? All right, you know? I mean, the fact is, he could have sold it. He could have kept it. He could have used it for himself. He could have thrown it away. I mean, think about this. How many little boys do we know that little lads, they just, they get busy and they lose stuff and they throw it away. And, but he didn't do that. You know what he did? He gave what was in his hand to Jesus. And God will use what is given to him to be a blessing to the person that gives it. My life has been an incredible, incredibly blessed life. Because as a young man, I, I got saved and I gave my life to Christ to, for, uh, to go into ministry. And over the years, I've been faithful to the best of my ability. And you know what's happened as a result? And, you know, I hear a lot of preachers that want to complain about how hard it is. And sure, there are some difficulties let me tell you something, that this that God has allowed me to do is an incredible blessing. I, not only have I been able to do what I love doing, but I get to see the return on the investment. I, I don't know that there are that many jobs that get to see the return on the investment that a pastor would get to see. I mean, you know, one thing to sow financially and reap a financial blessing but it's another thing to sow into human beings and see God multiply that. And the point is this. God will use what is given to him, not only to be a blessing to others, but it'll be a blessing to you. Did you notice in this story, it almost is thrown in there like we don't even think about it much. Jesus used this. Five loaves, two fish. He fed thousands of people and oh, by the way, they picked up 12 baskets of leftovers. 12 baskets. And there's a lot of speculation on why 12. Maybe it was for each of the disciples uh, to have lunch for the next few. I don't know. I have no idea why. But here's what I do know. When you give what is in your hand to God, not only will he use it to bless others, but he will bless you as well. There was a man, a little country preacher that was challenging his church. And uh, what he did was he, he challenged them to give themselves as an offering to God. He kept saying that. Give yourself as an offering to God. Give yourself as an offering to God. And as they do in a lot of churches, they had an invitation at the end where someone would sing a song and people would come forward. And sometimes they'd go and pray, and sometimes somebody would pray with them. Sometimes they'd pray by themselves. But this 
man that was there in the audience listening to this pastor. He had not been a Christian for very long. And he heard the pastor challenge, come give yourselves as an offering to God. And this man walked down the center of the aisle. He walked in front of that entire church. And he looked up at the stage and looked at the pastor. He said, I'd like an offering plate, please. The pastor had no clue what this guy was going to do. He thought maybe he's going to take another offering. All right, let him go ahead, you know. This man took this offering plate and he set it on the floor. And as best he could, he stood in that offering plate and looked up to heaven and said, I give myself completely to you as an offering. Now, let me ask you a question. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to say yes to God? Are you willing to say to God, I'm giving myself to you as an offering? If you'll do that, he'll take you and he'll bless you. and He'll break you, but he will use you greater than you can ever possibly, possibly imagine. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful, wonderful story. The miracle that Jesus did was to show that he is God, that he has all power. But it's also given to us to challenge us. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd help each of us to be like that man, the old country preacher that was saying, give yourself as an offering to God. Help each of us to give to you what is in our hand. The greatest ability we have is not our talent. It's not our mental capacity. It's not our money. But it's our availability to you. And God, help us to truly believe that the greatest ability is availability and use us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, today, if you are in need of receiving Christ as your Savior, good news is He'll take you. He'll take you just like you are. And all you got to do is say something like this to God. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I believe he's the son of God, that he rose from the grave. And I'm asking you to come into my life to change me, to guide me, to lead me. And if you'll ask God to do that, it's one prayer that he always answers. Anyone that comes to him in faith, he'll save. And so I hope today online, if you want to receive Christ, that you'll mark that Uh, by clicking the button at the bottom of the screen. If in the room, put it on the next step card and uh, put it in the drop box on the way out to let us know that you've received Christ today. Well, after the service, we're going to have an opportunity for you to come by the overflow room here to your right as you walk out. And I'm going to be in there. And if you'd like to ask questions about next step, if you'd like to go through that class, if you just have a question about what it means to be a member, or if you want to get involved in a small group or in a ministry somewhere, I'll be there and you can stop by and uh, touch base with us about that, okay? Also, we're going to have our prayer team. Someone will be up here at front. If you have any prayer requests, uh, you can come and they will pray with you. And uh, I think that you'll be very blessed by doing that. Also, if you'd like to take communion, they'll be here uh, to help you with communion as well. All right? Well, God bless you. Thank you for being here. I want you to know that I love you. It's great to see you today. We'll see you next Sunday. God bless you. Have a great week.